Welcome to Trek Speak, the video podcast available on iTunes and also at trekspeak.com. Now, my next guest is a person who I first encountered, I think, back in the early 2000s when I opened Star Trek magazine and saw the column, the technology column, a fistful of data where we could find out all about the Trek tech and the various lore. It was an excellent read and I'm certainly very, very happy to be joined now by Larry Nemechek live on video Skype. Larry, it's great to speak with you. How are you doing today? I'm, I'm doing well, uh, and Darren, and, and happy first contact day to you, although it'll be delayed by the time people see this, I guess. <laughs> Absolutely. I think the Vulcans, uh, they may be somewhere in this world right now. Who knows? The Vulcans have landed. Well, at least since the 50s, supposedly. Absolutely. Now, if, Larry, we, if we accept Enterprise as canon. <laughs> Enterprise is certainly a subject I have on the list to talk about, and I can't wait to get to that. Uh, but certainly, I want to get a bit of a background on yourself. As I said there, that the first time I, I would have read the name Larry Nemechek, it was through that column, and I was absolutely astounded at the time. Uh, people would send in all sorts of random questions, and I believe you still do the column to today. Uh, it, it was amazing how you could answer those questions. I suppose, what was the background that began to leave you with all that knowledge. How did you first get into Star Trek and what are your memories of it? <laughs> well, uh, here's the thing. I was a rerun baby. I've told this story a few times, but uh, I owe it all or I blame it all on my ninth grade science teacher who basically one day I, I stopped by and she was kidding with a couple of, of her you know, students. And uh, she, was, she was first year out of college, very idealistic and young. And one day, and, and a great teacher, and um, she, one day I walked by and she and a couple students had put a blue dot on their foreheads. And we used to have Ajax Cleanser, used to use um, bl the blue dot cleanser as its advertising motto. And I said, what is this, Ajax blue dot, blue dot cleanser? And she said, oh, Larry, no, it's the Hawkins. <laughs> I said, what? She said, you know, the Hawkins from Mirror Mirror. And what? <laughs> she says, oh, Larry, don't tell me you don't watch Star Trek. And I was like, uh, no. So she like it. It was almost like homework. It's like go go home and watch. And we had a channel that showed it. You know, it was the rerun era, so we, they showed it at uh, after school. Absolutely, yeah. and I did. Yeah. And I guess the rest, as they say, is history. So I blame Mrs. Pollard. This is it. Well, what a great connection there, and I think what a learned school teacher as well to point you in that direction. Did you ever actually get to speak to her again and and tell her, you know, what an influence maybe she had? You know, I, I hadn't, in fact, in some of these fan films and some stories, someday I'm going to have a character named, you know, Chief Pollard. I mean, I think that's a great, you know, crew type name. But I, you know, I've tried to look for her on Facebook. She was a teacher. I'm, I'm going to try to dig a little deeper sometime. But I've done cursory looks and I haven't found her. But I'd love to. I'd love to. <laughs> and if by some weird chance she ever hears one of these, um, you know, <laughs> at Larry Nemechek on Twitter there, I can't call her Becky. It's always got to be Mrs. Pollard. <laughs> you know, in that time, what was it like it, it, you know, to be a Star Trek fan, watching those first run episodes and uh, I suppose kind of having people talk about it in school? Was it a big subject? Well, young whippersnapper, I don't know if it's that. <laughs> um, actually, you know, it's, that was a select group. It's, we've had the geek revolution now and the girl geek, fan girl revolution and everything now. And, you know, geeks are running the world. And we have a, we have a Trekkie president now, as you know. Mm -hmm. and, um, and we have a big – in Big Bang Theory, we have our number one sitcom is all about geeks. But, and geeks are running the world. But uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't so much an outcast thing. I mean, I grew up in Oklahoma, in, a, in central Oklahoma, where it's fairly populated and, and – um, I remember when the making of Star Trek came out, I didn't think of myself as a fan. It was just, just I like this show. Oh, look, here's a book about the show, it was, which is a classic book. All your listeners should get, uh, should get the making of Star Trek by Stephen Whitfield. And uh, then the tech manual came out, and we just would talk about it a little bit. I had two or three, uh, you know, two or three friends that we'd talk about it at school. But um, it really wasn't until I was out of high school and into college and, you know, Star Wars hit and Close Encounters and Star Trek fandom finally had its victory in the motion picture and then things were off and rolling. And then you had 10, 15 years of, um, you know, in 85% <laughs> of the world seemed to not get it and 15% of the world got it. And then that <laughs> ratio kind of 
went up over time, thank goodness. Absolutely, of course. Uh, did you then at some point say, let me have a look at a convention? I mean, when did it first dawn on you that there were people meeting up and, and sort of having conventions and things like that happening? Yeah, well, I, sh I should have said that I remember the first time I was buying at a, there was a mall bookstore uh, that used to have everything in it. And the day I bought one of David Gerald's books and um, another one. Anyway, I bought two books and the guy that was the checkout guy uh, was kind of a character and he said, oh, yes. Well, we always try, he was just seeing what I bought as he put it in the bag. Mm. And he said, oh, yeah, we always try to have everything we can on stock for all you Trekkies. And I went, Oh, oh, well, okay, I, I guess I am. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was the first time that happened. But um, I, there was a small, you know, we had conventions of different types and people would advertise or I would hear about things. Uh, and sometimes there were more kind of pop culture or comics conventions. We were small market, Oklahoma City area, and didn't have the biggest, especially in the early days and uh, I, I would read about the New York conventions happening and wish I could go or I would read about Chicago or LA and uh, went to a small one that was just a one day that my mom had to drive me to and uh, then got to college and when I was a and saw George Takei on a tour speaking uh, and then yeah, they'd show the blooper reels in a couple of episodes and then George would talk and that was some kind of a City to city thing, yeah. But the first real convention I went to was was an overnighter, and that was a big thing. And and um, and we had too many cons in college. And I just I just um, someone wrote me a letter, or I, I saw an ad somewhere for a local club, and it was tiny. But I went, and and I guess I was off and running. <laughs> wound up wound up being stuck in the middle and sucked in and organizing and and promoting and all that. Of course, you're now like an integral part. People uh, always uh, look forward to seeing you and you do various panels and all sorts these days. Uh, I suppose with the column uh, in the Star Trek magazine, uh, w how was that first mooted to you? Uh, I suppose you had done several different companions and we'll talk more about the Next Generation companion. When did that first come about? Well, as far as the, uh, the Titan column, um I came over to cover my friend Eric Stilwell was producing a the, the Generations convention when Generations came out and he co-produced that and uh, we were good friends and he said come over and I was doing stories for the Communicator, the official U.S. magazine before I was the editor that grew out of my working on the book after we were either coming out to L.A. or we moved here and I had started to build up my Rolodex so to speak and went over to be the exclusive reporter doing the behind the scenes story of the first generations convention and met so many in the British press pool mm -hmm. and um, met some of the guys from Titan and within the short time they had me writing and then within a couple of years had me start doing that column because it uh, kind of mirrored the one that was being done in the States by Richard Arnold then and uh, yeah I, I think it's been going since 1998 which is kind of amazing and you know even you know, the internet's taken some of the mystique out of it because people can either go online or or ask questions or whatever but um my site larrynimichek.com i have a feature called you know where you can where you can ask a question and they get questions in too so they see fit to um to have me still you know go off on things cuz that's all background has been one of my favorite parts of Star Trek always and I, I didn't get it at first that some people would rather write stories <laughs> mm, you know mm. everybody has their reaction to the thing that consumes them at first and my reaction was to sit around and with your tech manual medical reference and not so much get techie geeky but background and you know today it's canon but we used to say fill the background gaps they're maddening you know Absolutely. and uh, so that's I guess that's kind of the background uh, that's what drove me until I did do the book and started doing so many interviews and 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 now I enjoy all that, uh, getting people's stories out and getting things preserved so that we don't, so that we have them for, for all time. And uh, I, you know, I have a news background and I have a theater background, so it's kind of a best of both worlds mm. uh, training. It's it's so amazing because I remember reading that column and uh, I remember just thinking. Wow, what a question. How is he going to answer this? And there was always maybe even three times the length of the question of a response to something that might not even be, you know, absolutely, you know, defined canon. I suppose, did you ever get any really wacky questions that didn't make the cut that you said, look, I can't answer this? Oh my gosh. Well, 
No, I mean, not really. For one thing, if we got really wacky questions, you know, we kind of culled them through. Mm, mm. But I, as far as is a question too small, no, I mean, one of my guiding things about that is I always try to, you know, sometimes people are just a little misguided or they just overlooked something. But I try to, for one thing, always give people a thorough answer. Mm, I hate mm. flip answers. Because if you're a fan and you're writing something like that, it's important to you. And I... You know, there's the other thing is there's so much misinformation out there, even with the internet, and pe- and sincere sometimes. Some people are sincerely doing that, and I even fall victim to the case of thinking, well, this is so old, this is so dusty old, and especially since JJ's movie came out in 2009, I've had to get over the idea that oh, this is so old, no one cares anymore, or everyone knows this because no, there's tons of we're getting new fans all the time, which yeah. is great, mm. and things things are not new to everybody all the time. So, uh, you know, it, just because it's old doesn't mean that it's dusty and, and, and it's old hat and why repeat it. So that's part of the thing about answering. But I, I like giving a thorough answer. You know, I try to throw in some humor when I can. And sometimes there isn't a straight answer. And we have to go with best guess. And people have always, you know, people have enjoyed doing that. And I try to, you know, where are the, what's the jumping off point? What's, what's the known what is it, Rumsfeld that said, what are the known knowables and the unknown knowables? <laughs> uh, that's kind of my, that's kind of my, uh, uh, kind of my, you know, uh, procedure, my protocol for trying to help people out that way. And to me, there's no such thing as a, you know, if it's a stupid question, well, that means that somebody just needs a little more help catching up. And, mm-hmm. you know, it's a big family and we need everybody to stay in it. So there's no such thing as a dumb question. Absolutely. I, I suppose on the US side of things, people would know you well for uh, Star Trek Communicator, as you mentioned there, that US magazine. I suppose that kind of had a bit of a different take on, on the format and there was often blueprints, which I know were uh, you were associated with putting technical sort of things in there. And uh, there was all sorts of different articles as well, a, a bit of a different take than the UK magazine. I suppose, what was it in the end that happened with Communicator that led it to stop being published I, I did enjoy it and, and I thought it was a fresh take on the magazine format you know well now I just just so we're clear communicator was the the official fan clubs magazine right 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 and it had gone it had started from it was started by Dan Madsen when he was uh, doing a newsletter when the motion picture came out and instead of shutting him down licensing uh, Gene Roddenberry said no let's bring him into the fold oh. and he you know it evolved from a newsletter to a small to a to a offset print sheet to a small digest magazine and then a slick and by the time um, I did the companion and was interviewing people and started selling freelance writing to to Dan uh, within three or four years he decided he wanted somebody in LA and we had moved here by then and and I was doing a lot of work at the lot for the fact files by then and so in 1998 I became managing editor and then Decipher Games bought the communicator and the fan club license and when the game market went down um, in the 2000, in 2005, they had to shut the magazine down. And before Dan and I got our, well, we were we were pitching to bring it back. Um, and it was the same time that everything uprooted with Viacom, as far as splitting CBS from Paramount and awarding. I call it the Viacom divorce, <laughs> letting letting Star Trek go live with the mom, CBS, <laughs> and it gets to visit the dad, Paramount Pictures, every three or four years. <laughs> and uh, the mom is kind of ignoring it right now, but the dad's doing all it can. Uh, and in that complicated divorce settlement, um, you know, licensing switched around. A lot of people came and went. And uh, the Titan, they just let Titan's magazine sell over in the States. But what's ironic is my association with the Fact Files, which was known everywhere in the world but in the States, Mm -hmm. because they couldn't compete with uh, Pocket Books' books, uh, in the end was amortized in the States through that thick Star Trek magazine that sold over here. And what's ironic is on one hand, the Communicator and Star Trek magazine for three or four years were were competing with each other. But at the same time, I'd had a hand in both because a lot of the background that the magazine had, I had done for fact files, mm-hmm. so which was a great gig. And, and we did, for years, we did more fact files things in Japan with DVD special um, issues. So that's, it's been, as I said, I had this big UK. I've worked with Titan. I've worked with uh, the fact files people out of uh, uh, aerospace or midsummer publications and a lot of... Um, I have a lot of good, great friends in the UK that I've worked with, and uh, I haven't got to see near enough. Yeah, yeah. 
it's very enlightening when you talk there about the communicator i suppose from my point of view i would have seen that maybe on the shelf alongside other magazines and not really realized that in a sense that it was from the fan club roots just i thought that's the us mag you know but uh it's certainly you wouldn't notice i mean this was a high quality thing as you say really slick uh, thank you and it's just just incredible I, I think it was that magazine that first revealed to me the new voyager cast and i remember looking at it going we've just had ds9 about you know it felt like about six <laughs> months ago they're doing another one you know what I mean? but i suppose in, in terms yeah. of writing for star trek of course i i do I have so much interest in your writing and the the next generation companion which i told you earlier i have the early edition uh and you rightly pointed out i need to get that new edition but i suppose that's another yes, story yes you do uh but i must say it's so comprehensive and uh, i would say alongside the ds9 companion there really has been no books written quite like them for detail and for for all sorts of stories that are added in there i suppose what was the writing process for the next generation companion did it involve a lot of like on set uh, activity or interviews or how did it come about and kind of form together well it did eventually <laughs> yeah, yeah it's i mean i i've I, we used to do um and still could do a whole panel just on this. I'm I like I said I had a theater background. I was working in news in Oklahoma. Uh, I had done my self-published annual guides before there was a before Mike and Denise did the encyclopedia. I had done a book based on B. Joe Trimble's old concordance for the original series that I sold myself, and then we sold on the fan market, and that got through the help of a lot of people at the lot that got the attention of licensing. And I was, uh, I guess, one of two finalists to do uh, do a companion book. What got me was when they first called me. I mean, I loved that encyclopedic, uh, you know, writing and collating and digging out things. Now, Memory Alpha is doing the same thing, but it was a lot lonelier in the '80s when you had your forehead VCR, you know, and no <laughs> nothing official. And I'm doing that at home. And um, but that's what got. The mention you can still find those TNG one two three books on eBay somewhere. I had to stop doing them when when Pocket signed me. But the other thing was they uh, said, well, it's not going to be an encyclopedia; it's going to be an episode guide. And I said, okay, great. And can you do it in three months? <laughs> and this was the first five years of the series, and I'm coming in, you know, at the fifth year. Whoa. And I thought, uh, okay, it's I, I had always heard stories about actors when they're cast, and they say, now this is yours. You can scuba dive, right? Or you, you can ride horseback, right? And they say, oh, yes, of course. And they get the part, and then they run out and take scuba lessons real fast, you know, kind of a thing. So I said, sure, I can do this in three months. And they said, well, you've got the data, but you've got all the, the data, right? And I said, well, yeah, but, you know, I had the database, but I didn't have the interviewing. I didn't have the behind-the-scenes human glue. And very present in my mind as a model was not so much B. Joe's concordance for that, but, but uh, Stephen Poe's. Stephen Poe Whitfield's uh, making the original making of Star Trek book. Again, it's a classic everybody should read. Mm, mm, and mm. Um, that was my model. And what I wanted to do, we didn't get to put in as many things like call sheets and production sketches and all that kind of thing. It wound up being an episode still for each episode and some, and some behind the scenes photos. But um, I, I got six months instead of three, all because of a dispute Leonard Nimoy was having with license over his image. And they wanted to get that done because the big news out of season five of Next Generation was, you know, was Spock. It was Spock being mm, on Next mm. Generation, and it tied the. And it was a little odd to have the first printing without N Leonard Nimoy in the biggest show of the series so far, which the first few books were actually that way. But I learned real fast in Hollywood. It's not about the words; it's about the pictures. See, mm. so there you go. <laughs> <laughs> it's you know, but that was a rush job, and then for the two updates after that, especially the middle one, the red one, you've got. I had a. I came back and got to do. You know, as many as I could, I could do carte blanche. And and the great thing was that I expected the gates to fly open. I'm an official author, licensed author, <laughs> and that didn't happen because I learned a lot of reality about the way this all works and the way there's different turfs and things. And just because I licensing says I'm an official author, other you know production doesn't care. They're just trying to get a show done. So it put it back on me to actually get networked and and get relationships made with people, which in the long run was great because then uh, even after Next Generation went away, we mo had moved out here and I kept it up uh, and kept up relationships with everybody and continued to do annual um, interview, archival interviews with er writers and producers and designers all through DS9 and Voyager into the end of Enterprise 
and and then do the movie uh, the movie interviews too because I knew we'd have chapters in the book eventually mm, mm. on the movies. Absolutely. I mean, it's such a great read. And I think, as you say, anyone who wants to pick that up should, should go and pick it up now and get that new edition. Some great uh, extra stuff at the end. I have seen it and I must, uh, as I say, make sure to pick that one up. I was fascinated as well by a, a fact. There we go. There we have it. That's the one. There we have. And it certainly is a great cover, great book. And uh, as I say, I can't put it over enough. Now, what a fascinating uh, fact as well about yourself about the official Star Trek site that you actually did the first live chat back in 1996. <laughs> now, at that time, was it a case that you were thinking this is going to be the future of all Star Trek? I mean, did you realize what a place you would have in Internet Star Trek sort of history now <laughs> uh, after, um, you know, back then, I think? Well, back then, uh uh, Guy Vardaman and Mark Wade had just were the two guys responsible for getting a star, you know getting a Star Trek uh, website going that was the official website, and you're talking 1996, so the year that first Contact came out, right, um, right, and Generation. Here's some trivia for you too. Mark Wade, who was the producer then for all the years until just about five years ago, and he's at Disney now. Um, when they ch revamped and got rid of the way Star Trek dot com was was handled after about ten years, but Mark was part of the experimental group at what they used to call Paramount Digital Kitchen up in Silicon Valley, not Hollywood, but up by San Francisco, and they did a website for Generations in ninety four. And here's some more trivia for you: Generations was the first movie to have its own website. Wow! Wow! As it was, it was an experiment. So after that, they were going to launch this, and it was very trendy. You know, the internet was new. Uh, I'd only had email for about a year or two, from about '95, I think. And um, there's some pages that are cached, but uh, at the last minute, they were looking for a sponsor, and rather than have it be Apple, Microsoft jumped in. And so for the first year, it was the subscription model, and you know, the internet was new, and they were trying out different things. And for the first year or so, you had to be a subscriber to MSN to uh, to get all the information. Mm, mm. Um, and there's a lot longer story with some of the, you know, it's like everything else. It's like, you know, 11th hour madness trying to get it launched. But it did. And since I was a published author and I was coming in and doing a lot of consulting work and building the database, you know, uh, as on contract work, they just were trying to get the system down. Mm, and what's mm. ironic is there were so many bugs still in the system that we realized later there were about, uh, I don't know, there were like, you know, ten or fifteen people in the chat room while we were doing it. It's like it's like being on TV in 1948 or something. You know, it was like in New York. And there's how many people in New York even have a TV, much less can get the signal. Right. Um, and uh, we realized later that uh, that's why I was the first guest because I was in the group and I w I had some some notoriety as an author and a columnist. So I was the first guest, and it wasn't like, oh, you'll be down in history as the first guest. It was like, Larry, can you help us come, you know, test the system? Okay. Mm -hmm. And then later on I went, oh, I guess I was the first jacket. <laughs> later on we also found out that there had been all kinds of technical problems, and we're not even sure how those 28 people even were getting a signal <laughs> <laughs> to yeah. even pick it up. Whoa. So that was kind of amazing. But yeah, it, it dawned on me later that I have this weird little niche in history. Well, it's trailblazing there. stuff, definitely. I mean, when you see all the live video and audio that, that people at home now are broadcasting, and what a kind of a, a new frontier it definitely was back then to have access to people and to be able to chat like that. I suppose getting on to your own projects of today, I was very, very interested to read about your upcoming film documentary, The Con of Wrath, which the title sells it first of all, but the story is a real, real interesting one. Can you tell me a bit about the story and about the process of filming this uh, documentary so far? Yeah, well, uh, f two things. One, I have been a word guy for so long, the last 10 years I'd wanted to do something in media, and uh, I, was getting, I, we were gonna, I was getting to work on some of the video pods for the Star Trek tour, uh, and we were going to work on the making of the Star Trek the, the tour DVD, which became Star Trek the ex ex Exhibition. Uh, but the owners that I was involved with went away, and it picked up new owners, so that didn't happen. And a few other things happened that were, you know, almost and then didn't. And what the documentary is about, which kind of was a huge light bulb when it did go off for me accidentally, but serendipitously, was the first big con road trip I got to do as a kid was to this amazing show. And, and again, one of the things I want to always try to do is 
fans come into Star Trek, you know, where they come into it, but also at the time and history and our culture and our tech level. And as you said, we have streaming video. I mean, this this is very cool to be on a video podcast. This is a first for me. Right, right. But I do, you know, I have a blog now, and, and I put my video chats up with, you know, Marina and Jonathan and uh, Ron Moore and Ira Bear and, and fans uh, up when I can. Anthony Montgomery, just the other day. You know, we're doing all this, and... Um, but back in the day, the first Trek conventions started in 72, and they were, they were always limited to the big urban areas. And finally, L.A. started having them. I think there were some in Chicago. Conventions everywhere, but the majority of it, the programming being Star Trek. And guys in Houston, Texas had been doing cons and decided there was one guy that had the dream of doing the first, I call it, first big Star Trek rock show. Rather than have it just be at a hotel, you know, the old format, to actually go and have it be at an arena, a basketball arena, a show arena, and have everybody together for the first time, and then have all these things like a laser show and an orchestra and a talk show and a revolving stage and have the whole cast. And they actually timed this for the opening of, of the Wrath of Khan, which wound up being a huge hit. They had Starlog Magazine involved, which before the internet – was the, the final thing that finally kind of united science fiction fans, especially media fans. Mm, mm. And um, Carrie O'Quinn was the pu publisher, and it had started in the late 70s and picked up steam. And just in time to harness the Star Wars and Star Trek revival and then the explosion of science, you know, Close Encounters and E.T. and Blade Runner and, and a lot of the whole – and genre films and everything genre-ish, fantasy – uh, becoming uh, becoming more mainstream really laid the groundwork. So these guys in Houston came up with this great idea. It was called the Ultimate Fantasy because of having everybody together for once, and they attached it to the regular Houston Con convention and 18,000-seat 18, 18, arena, and it, everybody got excited. They had everybody but Nimoy, who at the end actually did just change his mind and want to come, and then they wouldn't let him, which is hysterical, <laughs> but uh, had been told that it was a sellout, Long story short, it turned into a debacle. They got there, uh, had locals doing it. The L.A. people, all the cast, Harb Bennett came in. Turned out that it was not a sellout. The convention itself was doing fine, the little normal convention at the Shamrock Hilton. But out at the Summit Arena where the NBA Rockets played, they were barely going to have 800 to 1,000 people, not 18,000 people, which is a huge empty cavernous arena <laughs> when you get to right, it. Right. But the amazing thing about the story is – no one left. No one gave up. Mm -hmm. The L.A. Hollywood people all decided that those people that showed up deserved a show, and not just for a few hours, as some people have talked about other meltdown cons that happened that failed. They went on with the whole weekend schedule, two shows on Saturday, one on Sunday. The orchestra got downsized into a, into a, a, you know, a six-piece combo or whatever. All the crew went on with it. Now, there were all kinds of crazy stories along the way, and the hotel, back at the hotel, freaked and tried to throw people out of their rooms because they thought they weren't going to be paid. Mm -hmm. So there were all these wacky stories with it. Now, me as a kid, we went down, um, couldn't check in, had to rebook our room. We saw what we could see. We saw the show. I took pictures. Then we said, to hell with this. And we went down to Galveston because I'd never been to the Gulf Coast before. Went to the beach, went to Sierrama. <laughs> and then we went back up to Oklahoma, 10-hour drive. So it was just one of those things stuck back in your head. I knew there was one story in Star Log a few months later. But I think that was it. You just had to be there and have the memory. Mm, mm. Two years ago, I ran into a guy at, a, at an after-con party back home in Oklahoma City. He was the tech manager of the stage, and my head exploded. He was telling all these great stories, and I thought, this needs to be preserved. My reporter, historian, journalist you know, kicked in. And then I thought, no, my modern Hollywood sensibility kicked in and said, no, Larry, forget interviewing. We need to get them on tape, Absolutely. interviews. And um, – and then I thought, maybe this will hang together as a documentary. And I started thinking if, how much of the cast would probably do this and, and the locals. And it was very producible. So I, I had the greatest light bulb moment of my time there. And, and everybody's been great about uh, going. But we're not doing it full. You know, it's not a full-time job. So we're doing bits at a time. But we're making progress. And I'm hoping 2013 we're, we're out with it. It might still be a little after that. It's been great. Uh, Walter Koenig was kind of one of the ringleaders of it all, and he was very gracious. We've had Walter Harb Bennett, who was the mm, original mm. producer, who's retired. Um, 
had a great road trip up to see him. And we're working on more of the rest of the cast and people involved. All the pe- original people in Houston have been great. Uh, Wendy Doohan has spoken to us because she was there with Jimmy. And uh, I'm overdue to put a new we, – we have kind of a raw footage trailer up at the site, which you can go to at conofrath.com. And we're making some – we have a donor system set up. But I, I'm probably going to be going over to um, – maybe going to upgrade that up to Kickstarter. But for right now, I'm using PayPal. And it's worked great. Uh, and we're also looking for survivors, what I call the survivors. Because here's what you need to know, Darren. <laughs> if you, you said you like the title, right? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Okay, well, here's the thing. I didn't make that up. I can't take credit. Because I told you the show was originally called The Ultimate Fantasy. Mm. Well, you know, fans being fans, by the end of the weekend, they were already calling it The, the, ultimate, the, ultimate, um, the ultimate Fallacy. <laughs> You know, the ultimate, uh, uh, what else? The ultimate, well, fuck up. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and, but some people, really ingenious, there was at least one dealer that was selling buttons, and it was already catching on that says, I survived the con of Wrath. <laughs> you know? And it was only two weeks after Wrath of Con had opened, so everybody was, you know, really, it was really a hot name for it. So my, my friend Kevin, that's a great graphic artist that has done all my logos, um, did that great con of Wrath logo that's based on theirs. And, mm-hmm. uh, it's uh, an, it, I, it catches eyes. People are. I'll have a table at a convention or somewhere, and you'll see people go by, and they'll do a double take, <laughs> which is exactly what we want. So. Yeah, oh, I encourage people to check out the trailer that's available, and you can already see that there's a such a high quality look to the show, and I'm really looking forward to it. I, I could honestly see a whole series, and and I do hope that uh, you know this documentary leads to another for you. I'm sure it's one of just dozens of stories that you might have covered uh, in the last couple of years, and and all of the Trek. T- TV stuff that you could talk about. I mean, I suppose it's endless the possibilities of what you could actually do film wise. Wow. Well, I mean, I, there's times when I've thought, what should I do next? But I'm just going to concentrate on, you know, because we're kind of doing this, I don't want to say in a leisurely way, but we're not doing it on a regular tight production schedule. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, we're doing it as a weekend project. But yeah, thank you, though. Uh, I should tell anybody that goes that that's, you know, it's not a, it's not even a polished trailer trailer. It's uh, kind of some raw footage, but you know, edited down a little bit into a rough cut just for a couple minutes. Mm, mm. So um, we're, we've got another one we're trying to get up here within the next month. It'll be a little more have a little more zing and sizzle to it. Well, I certainly um, understand you know that method of of collecting the materials. I mean, people aren't always accessible exactly when you may would like to have them and and to be able to interview them. So I know it is a kind of a process of just collecting. Uh, you know, footage over time. I, I suppose my only uh, experience with something like that, I did have a convention flake, uh, and uh, without going into too much detail, I suppose, it was in London actually, and all the guests were booked, magazine advertising, all sorts, and I think it was eventually then, I was about two days away from getting on the plane, and we found out, right, it's not actually going to happen. I was still there on the day I walked past the venue, crushing moment. Uh, but what, <laughs> what, what, what could I do? But actually, incidentally, and I suppose people you know, would maybe even be able to find out what convention that was, the guy eventually was pulled up on like a consumer television program of, of, of all things, and he was made to answer for his crime. So, I mean, it was justice in the end, you know? Well, what what could, it was in London? What, what it year was? was that yeah, I'm sure people could maybe look maybe around probably 2003, and they would probably find out the London convention because there aren't that many of them. But mm-hmm. I mean, the guy, as I say, I saw him on television. I said, "Look, I didn't get my money back, but <laughs> 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 I suppose without mentioning the name, I didn't mention anything." But there you go. Uh, yeah. But anyway, you know that that's conventions for you, and I think I can certainly understand. Probably people were so disappointed at the time. Can you remember yourself, you know, having kind of gone and made your way to that convention, being really annoyed at the end, going, "What happened?" Like, you know. Well, I was, and that's something I've kind of gone back, and I had a couple of buddies with me, and I'm going to have them on as well. And we're also asking anybody. I, I call them the survivors, <laughs> you know. But we're asking, and I've already heard from several of them, and several of them have sent me photos, and we're, we've got video from the time. We're trying to find, because fa- it was 1982, and you, if you were well off, you might have had a big honk and, you know, home yes. video camera. Yeah. Or even still people maybe using 8mm. Um, we're looking for video for that, too. Have you found and of course, any? If anybody has it, you know, Larry at LarryNemichak.com or mm, through my mm. site, if, if they happen to, within the sound of our voice here. Um, 
so we're looking for stories that you know from people that were there. And we've already already gotten a lot. And me personally, we were so disgusted. We wanted we were just wanting to get to see the show. Me personally, it was about the third or fourth time I was trying to see D. Kelly, who was my favorite right, actor, and right. McCoy was my favorite character. <laughs> and I was just convinced because every time you'd see him in public, he seemed to be skinnier and skinnier and skinnier. Yeah. And I thought he's not going to be around for a while. Of course, he. It was 17 more years we had him after that, but um, I was just convinced I was never going to see him, you know, close up and mm, personal mm. because I we didn't. Um, they wound up being available. We missed the chance to see people uh, close up, but uh, we left on Saturday afternoon after we saw the show, and like I said, went down to the coast. But um, that, yeah, we were just kind of oh well, we got screwed. Yeah, yeah, you know? it's that feeling, isn't it? I, I kind of feel that as well. I mean, personally. Through a creation convention, I think it was, I managed to meet William Shatner and Leonard Nimoy at a London convention. I think that's all, as far as original series actors that, that I've actually met. Uh, it's always a pilgrimage, I think, coming from this side of the world and maybe heading over to the Las uh, Vegas convention, which I did once before. Uh, but I suppose, uh, regarding the uh, video that you also produce on YouTube, I think it's actually excellent because it's great to have access to, to as you say, people like Anthony Montgomery of an evening, have a, a chat with him and find out what he's up to. Uh, what is your YouTube? address for, for people who want to maybe check out the the extensive video you have up there at the moment oh well you, i should probably rebrand that i think it's a, i think it's larry n 77 mm, i mean mm. I, I try to steer people to my blog to see them there so i get the hits on the blog the, the blog is trekland uh blog the url is treklandblog.com and that grew out of people over the years saying what is it you do because by the time you say author editor consultant <laughs> writer, host, producer, archivist, historian, it's people are, you know, they're snoozed. <laughs> so and at one point, you know, I so at one point one time I said, well, I work in Trekland a few years ago. And um it comes in handy at times, but um now everybody you're supposed to have a, a tagline and an ankle show and all that kind of thing. And that's one that that works for me. So I thought, well, why fight it? And I just find when I was trying to think of what to name the blog, mm, mm. and I thought, uh, well, that'd be great. And then my friend, um, my friend Kevin, you know, did another great, uh, did another great logo for me where we're, where we're just saying greetings from Trekland like a postcard. That's great, yeah. like that, and um, which was you know my concept, and it it works. So that's what the uh, that's what the blog is. But I I uh, have a lot of things there, but I always host the videos there. But yeah, there. YouTube, they're very accessible. Larry in seventy seven is the channel that um, that has all my videos there. You have a very very busy schedule. It, it seems like almost every weekend you're somewhere doing something Trek related these days, aren't you? Well, it's well we're in con season. Um, yeah, this is this has been a, an interesting kind of year because I've actually I used to, you know, do the close ones. Uh, our old home convention, SoonerCon, has me come, and I'm I'm uh, over the years have switched up. We had a convention in Germany that that loved it, and my wife and I would go together. My wife worked on Voyager for five years, and uh, she's actually a very good um, script doctor. Mm, mm. So I'll put in a plug for her and workshops and things. But um, I, I yeah, the UK haven't got over, haven't been to Ireland at all. Looking forward to taking a non trek trip here in a few weeks but hopefully we will still meet some fans but i've only done a couple of conventions in the uk and done a, a jillion in germany it feels like and even um, a couple in italy and in greece and and visited prague for some little events and and one time in paris so and and the world tour in vienna <laughs> mm, mm, mm. in 99 for two weeks of when it was there um so uh, yeah it's been uh, this year's turning out to be kind of a busy travel year yeah, yeah. Um, with the 25th anniversary of next generation having done the book that's been kind of a and there's some of the events i'm not going to make calgary's having a huge exposition i'm not going to get to go to but um it's uh, I, I can run through them here before we get away but for anybody that's listening on this side of the pond but uh yeah Absolutely. it's 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 fun and my big question with JJ's movie was, you know, will fan will we have new and old fandom and mm -hmm. you know, will it split and you have the forty five years fandom and the new guys? And it's been really amazing and it hit me at Vegas in oh nine for the first time that that's not going to happen. If they're if they become 
enough people are being sucked in by JJ's movie that they want more. It's the old fan passion. Mm -hmm. And they came over and they were new fans and we had a ton of them. And they're going back and watching the original series and migrating to Next Generation. And it's been great. The, the evil master plan for, re <laughs> for refreshing Star Trek uh, is going according to schedule. So. Isn't it fantastic for fans who are just even starting now that they get access to such high quality episodes with the Blu-rays now and the original series on there, the movies, and now of course finally we've got Next Generation making its way out. It's a fantastic time to be introduced to Trek. I mean, we've been watching Next Generation, as some people have said, like through a dirty windscreen, if you like. I mean, it's been cleaned up so fantastically. What were your reactions when you saw uh, some of that high-def Next Generation material for the first time? Well, it, it is. It is gorgeous. It's a, and it's a complete... What's, what people may not get is saying you're going to remaster in Blu-ray the original series is a totally different proposition from the from Next Generation because original series is just a matter of going in like any other film and cleaning it up first off if you go back to the negatives and then the effects were modernized you know but done lovingly in the same vein and spirit and only expanded when when the old you know like Doomsday Machine and some other episodes where, um, where the budget limits and the technological limits uh, You'd love to see something new, but at the same time, I like how they have dual versions where if you're a purist, you can still see this, you know, so you don't lose touch with the 60s technology. Yeah. And you can still see the, you know, the, the bad mat lines <laughs> yeah, around the yeah. cells where the stars come through. <laughs> and, and Next Generation is such a different animal because it was much more modern in what they did, and they had a bigger budget for effects and things. But the whole thing on a TV budget in 1987 was all shot on film. The effects were shot on film. And then it was dumbed down, if you will, to video to put together because that's mm -hmm. the only way they could do it on time and, and a money budget. And the, what's even more amazing, I think, than the quality of the picture – and then, then once you do that, then you come in and do your Blu-ray magic and all your tech and on your audio and sound. Yeah. But the biggest leap of all is just getting rid of that you know, like down-resing. That they had mm, to mm. do, and then they brought it back. And if you remember watching it when it broadcast, you'd see. I mean, the first season, especially the stars, would alias a little bit. It was it was really a kind of a sparkly, you know, effect. But people were so thrilled. It wasn't like people said, oh, "I'm not going to watch this. This is chintzy," <laughs> and flipped it off. Yeah, they were so yeah. thrilled to be seeing Star Trek on TV weekly again, you know, despite the naysayers who there was that faction. There's and every time, not to change tangent, but every time Star Trek takes a new turn. There's always the naysayers for some reason, you know. And yes. with, uh, oh, with uh, the Wrath of Khan, people didn't like the fact that Spock was being killed off, and there was a very vocal, you know, contingent on that. And Next Generation, there were some vocal fans. Oh, it's not Kirk, Spock, and McCoy. How can you call it Star Trek? <laughs> and people that didn't like Inter uh, the DS9, it was wasn't on a ship. It didn't go anywhere. You know, yada yada, and Enterprise was a prequel. It wasn't going into the future, and Star Trek is going into the future, and which is you know, poppycock because, I mean, Enterprise is in the future from us. So it's like, get out of here. <laughs> Just shut up and Absolutely. let them do a show. Yeah. And, you know, now we don't, have, no, we, don't, we don't have a weekly series. So, and then J.J.'s movie had all the, you know, the bit with the, with the canon alternate universe background. So, um, you know, the remasters are, are brilliant. And, uh, oh, what I was going to say was what's amazing even more about the cleanup is the fact that to do the effects without, without reshoots, that crew, Rob Legato and Dan Curry and Ron Moore and Gary Hetzel and those guys in the, under Peter Lartson, they were almost anal about how they filed everything because you know they had a tight money and they would want to reuse things down the line. They were even, even when things went CG, they knew that they had real film elements that they had shot once and they had such a continuity of people that they knew they could go back and, and pull things out, mm -hmm. which now helped again because they're going back. You know, they're, it's like the Tinker Toys of you know, or the Legos of building this model and all the pieces, you know, it's been torn down for years, but all the pieces are still there in the box labeled so that now if you want to go back and put the effects back together for some, you know, I, uh, the naked now or conspiracy, whatever it is, um, on the first season of Next Generation, the pieces are all there in the boxes in the archives. Yeah, yeah. That's what's amazing to me is that they – I mean I knew it was well-documented because they were actively using it. But the fact that the shows have been down for six years, 
it was all just put away in the archives where you could go back and you know there's they're not they didn't lose the Ark of the Covenant like in <laughs> Raiders yeah. of the Lost Ark down in the warehouse somewhere. The stuff was all labeled and accessible and and oh my god, who knew then that they would want all those elements for a DVD, you know, a Blu-ray remastered DVD. But that's been that's been a godsend. Absolutely. So it's it's been doable on a budget and not, you know, it's been expensive to do and a totally different critter than the original series remastering. But who, you know, if, if that had not been done, it would have almost you would have just thrown, you would have been reshooting, CGIing every single effect shot and and much less uh, getting the original film from all the live action stage shots. And that's what's amazing about this. Pro to me, that's what's amazing. That's right. I remember reading probably two, three years ago after the original series Blu-rays had come out, there was a lot of doubt and a lot of speculation about what was and wasn't archived. And some people just claim, look, they're not ever going to do it. I just hoped at the time that years would go by and that it would become possible to do. I suppose the big question remains then, uh, I suppose the viability of this project will be a big factor in this, but onwards to DS9 Voyager, I'm sure Enterprise has no problem making it to Blu-ray, but do you see those series making it to that format in the near future? Well, I don't... I, if there's one thing you can always count on, it's that, you know, corporations and studios need the next thing to sell. And the fact that technology improves what seemed to be, you know, it wasn't so long ago when I first started working the fact files, it cost anywhere from 100 to 300 dollars to do a frame grab, you know, <laughs> and you had Whoa. to have professionals do it. Yeah. So, and we were just bound by the film library, except we'd have a list of five or six frame grabs in the companion, much less in fact files. And now everybody and their dog can do it at home on their laptop. So, you know, um, so you never say never. I would think that eventually it would get around to it, especially by the fact, and again, every time I do a, a convention panel, whether it's a, one of my slideshows where we have a lot of jokes and information, or, or whether it's not visual but we talk and I try to lead a discussion, um, either way I like to always take a survey in the audience. And the one thing that I've seen shift over the years, uh, and it's what I predicted and then more importantly it's what Ira Bear predicted, was that DS9 was always kind of the middle child, stepchild show. And it's picking up thanks to the DVDs, which you know are still the original DVD issues, and uh, the accessibility on Netflix. Mm, mm. Um, I don't know what I, I don't know how this translates to you guys. You yeah, know. we have that service indeed. Yeah, yeah. The fact that it's there, it's picking up an awful lot of people, and people are that were so uh, gung ho on Ron Moore's Battlestar Galactica. You know, a lot of the roots of what informed his version of Galactica is what he and Ira did on uh, on DS9. Mm, and mm. Um, I'm not saying it's derivative, I'm just saying if you, it's, that's what you enjoy, the darker, grittier Star Trek. So all the people that criticized DS9 for, uh, you know, it wasn't on a ship, it didn't go anywhere, uh, by the time they got into the Dominion War, which was controversial also because you had people say, you can't do war stories in Star Trek, Star Trek's about peace. Well, Star Trek's about humanity and how it reacts to things, and, and their point was, here's how we react to the worst thing in the world, which is uh, the worst thing ever, which is a war, especially one, one that looks like it might be a hopeless war. Yes, yeah. And, um, uh, and Ira was right. He said it would be 10 or 15 years before DS9 was appreciated the way, because it's the stepchild, the middle child, squeezed in between Next Gen's success and, oh, Voyager is the flagship of a new network, and... It's a network show, and um, it's getting its own due. And, of course, DS9 was finished two years before 9-11, and the whole uh, – there's sometimes I get a little tired of that, uh, you know, well, that was pre-9-11 thinking, you know, and, well, everything has changed. Well, it's just – it's not the only thing that's changed is that we got a kick in the butt mm -hmm. about what's – just like Pearl Harbor was. You know, it's like, oh, the world changed, and we kind of were snoozing along here, and here's what's potentially possible. And a lot of the issues that came up, at least in the States, and I'm sure in the UK too, I think – the whole personal liberty versus collective security um, is a big chunk of DS9's themes, mm -hmm. and and religious fundamentalism versus secularism, and those are all you know big themes in DS9, and I think it's really that's the one thing I think it's getting its due now. So, back to your question about DVDs, I I would think that that would there's somebody already thinking about what to do for um, the next thing, and I would I don't know why it wouldn't be DS9 to begin with. 
Yeah, let's hope, as I say, and you mentioned it a bit, that uh, the standard definition, DVDs in particular, I mean, when you watch them back, you can see artifacts and, you know, they're certainly not the, the highest quality that hopefully we will hope to achieve at some point in the future. But speaking a bit about Star Trek Enterprise, uh, when it eventually made it to become Star Trek Enterprise, uh, I, I suppose when that show started and it just had the Enterprise name, uh, it didn't put me off. Now, at that time, I suppose I was a big Voyager watcher, watched it every week, and I, I didn't want Trek to go away from TV, if you like, but I, I found it over the course of maybe the first and second season, it seemed to just shed viewers. I mean, it ended up with, you know, mm -hmm. basically people just abandoning ship for sure. And I just found that, you know, when you actually talk to people now, if you meet them in conventions, an astonishing amount of people will tell you, I never watched it past the first episode. I mean, some people who may even put over maybe an episode like Threshold of Voyager, they would not have watched Enterprise. I mean, I certainly like to give it a bit more credit than that. I wonder what you would think of what actually happened that led people to abandon it in the end. Well, I think uh, I think several things. I mean, casting Scott Bakula. I mean, if you think about it, Scott Bakula was the highest was the had the most uh, trademark of any of the lead captains at the time they were cast. I mean, Patrick was that guy you saw that that British Shakespeare actor that you saw in Dune, you know. Right, right, yeah. Uh, and was Royal Shakespeare. I mean, the highest profile actor in the Next Gen cast when they were cast was uh, Will Wheaton and Lavar Burton, if you think about it. Mm, that's the, right. The Luke. Associated Press. I remember I worked in news, and I specifically remember the the story, the AP story. When they announced the TNG cast, they talked about LeVar Burton from Roots, Will Wheaton from Stand By Me, and then this distinguished British guy is going to be the new captain. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> was the way it was. And, you know, no one knew. I mean, Avery Brooks had been Hawk on Spencer for Hire, which was, he was a second, you know, that was his claim to fame. Um, Kate Mulgrew had played uh, Mrs. Columbo. <laughs> right, <laughs> you know, yeah. a failed. Sp so, Ryan's hope. This, I'm not talking about their ability or their talent or anything or their big resume, but as far as the headline people. So, Scott Bakula was, you know, much less William Shatner when, when Star Trek came on. But Scott Bakula was very well beloved from, you know, Quantum Leap was another show, a little show that made good, that bucked the odds and stayed on year after year and had a very devoted fan following. And, and he had done other movies too. So, I mean, that was certainly in its favor. Um, Part of it was several things. I think there was a little bit of fatigue, but I think that was over. I think that was overplayed. Part of it was UPN continued to be a crippled little network that didn't even get into the whole country, and uh, I think it suffered from you know, lack of promotion. It didn't get promoted anywhere but on the network. But some of the fault goes into some of the writing and some of the conceptual things. I'll, you know, I'll. Um, I'll say that. I, people, some people didn't like the idea of a prequel to begin with, just yeah. like a lot of original series people. There are a lot of original series people that never watched The Next Generation. And they came, they, what's weird is they kind of came back for Enterprise. I'm finding all kinds of weird patterns over the years. <laughs> when we yeah. talk, there's no monolith called the Star Trek fan, just like Paramount is not a monolith or CBS. You know, there's factions and eddies and currents within it. And, um, the dumbest thing was probably, even though they were riding the foam, was having two shows on at the same time. Mm, mm. You know, and and Rick has gone on record and say he didn't want to do that, but the studio was saying, "Oh, let's strike while it's hot." Rick's favorite phrase is, "You can go to the well one too many times," <laughs> and that was happening. That was happening too. But there was a huge break in trying to make Enterprise, and they were very conscious and fearful of that. And they really, there was a big break to make Enterprise uh, a break. And to freshen up the crew, I, I mean the, the design crew and the production crew, and several people were changed out. Everybody almost had to – Herman and Zimmerman and Mike Westmore almost had to – Bob Blackman almost had to audition again in a way. And, um, and a few people, a few people you know, left. The stunt coordinator was changed. The prop master was changed. And um, – they went with the new look and the new, you know, the song was controversial, but they went with some new things that way. But I think the opening montage was great. I think in the end, what part of it was, was it just didn't go where people thought a prequel show leading into the Kirk years went. Mm, mm. And it was, the other thing was it came off being filmed very dark. And that was the thing that was befuddling everybody. There were a lot of fingers pointed. The network pointed at the transmission, at the production, at the, you know, development, at the digital 
they went to digital cameras last year. It it just came off as very dark, and they fiddled with that for two or three years before they got it. But I think um, a lot of people watched the first one and uh, the first few shows, and I think they had some writing problems the first year and getting their legs. And you know, the the first year of Enterprise is a little bit like the first year of Next Generation. There was a revolving door of writers, right? Uh huh. And um, uh, I think they were expecting the show to be the hot new thing and it didn't catch on right off and uh, of course a lot of people loved the last season a lot of people either loved or hated the Zindi year but the second season I think was even a little bit thinner than the first season and uh, I, I, I just yeah. think they weren't they didn't people were expecting the lead in to the Kirk years and I don't think it had quite the you know, I th and I think Scott's Captain Archer was you know beloved, but I think he had in mind something. I think everybody was expecting Captain Sam Beckett from from Quantum Leap. Exactly, League. this is it, isn't it? I mean, so many people mentioned the Quantum Leap show as soon as they heard of the casting, and they mm -hmm. couldn't quite get that out of their minds. I think over here, a lot of people they they found it quite funny actually uh, that he was suddenly a captain of a starship. You know, because <laughs> I think Quantum Leap was still heavy on the reruns, if you like. Uh, but I suppose with the the the, the watching of the series, kind of people eventually dropping it after that first episode maybe throughout the first season right. i was i watched it week on week but i do recall that some point around the end of the second season even i dropped off for three or four weeks and i'm not sure what it was but i, I think everyone was united in there was that low patch in season mm -hmm. two that was just tough going you know but when they started off with season three and properly st set up the arc and as you mentioned season four is i think universally acclaimed really isn't it i mean it was a it was a mm -hmm. smashing series of star trek like oh yeah the sad thing was i mean people they didn't want to say this at the time because there was some hope but the show was basically canceled at the end of this it was almost canceled in the second season, and they gave them a chance to. I mean, because things at CBS had changed, and UPN wasn't as independent as it had been, and it had not been managed very well uh, as far as you know uh, direction and programming and marketing, and was it was kind of taken in like the, you know, like it had filed for bankruptcy or something with protectorship <laughs> or something. But um, the Zindi year was the attempt to you know zing pow and get get viewers back. And ramp up the show and the tension and the pace and the and the concept level, and then it was almost canceled at the end of that year. But the studio, if you can get this, you know, conceptually, the network wants something right now. And when a show is gone, a network doesn't care about a show after it's over. Mm. Uh, a studio that did it has all the residual rights for reruns and merchandising and all that, and they're the ones with the invested you know, the investment and so they anted up they did a deal where they anted up more for the episodes per budget and uh, so it got a fourth year but it was unless something just shot through the roof sky high uh, it was it was going to be the fourth year was going to be the end year yeah and i know yeah. the cast was disappointed by that everybody's tried to be you know contemplative about it they hey they had more one, one more year than the original series so that's <laughs> Yeah, yeah. You know, that says something. But so many fans could not believe that, you know, just when the show is getting good, they take it away. Exactly. And it was it was kind of baked in the cake already. And and we were watching the things like the uh, you know, Brent uh, playing Eric Soong and the Augments trilogy mm -hmm. and the Vulcan mm -hmm. trilogy and some of those shows and they just didn't go sky high enough to make everybody to make UPN and CBS, you know, go, "Oh, okay, well this is all we needed to do." So, there you sad. have it. Very sad, but, isn't it? Because I always yeah. felt that there was always a tough beginning season. First season was always trying to form up what the show would be like. For any show, I think that that would be the case. And then, of course, the second season and third season. You know, most Star Trek series seem to kick off in the fourth season. I'm not sure if you'd agree with that. But I felt with Voyager, they had a whole new uh, outlook with Seven mm -hmm. and Nine. And obviously with Next Generation, Best of Both Worlds. And... Even DS9 with the war, I mean, there was something about season four that it took them that long to maybe just say, right, this is exactly what we need to do. So it does kind of sadden me to think that we could have had three more seasons potentially and what they would have done. What, what do you think they might have done post season <laughs> four? It's a huge question, I know. Or what would you ideally... No, no, I'm not laughing at you. I'm laughing at the fact that we were just talking about this. We were laughing that Manny Cotto has done uh, a lot of interviews. And, and he's not making it up. It's true. Yeah where he, he has talked about the ideas he had for the fifth season. 
and it's kind of interesting. I have a picture somewhere of they started off the year with a big board with uh, you know with index cards pinned up of all the basic ideas they wanted to get to for the year, and they did. There were two uh, left over. He wanted to do a Colonel Green, and he wanted to do a, a Starbase One show where they showed the building of the first Starbase. And he got to everything in his, but he had ten or twelve more ideas, and they got to everything but that one. So there, are, there's two ideas. But more than that, leading into, um, you know, leading into the the coalition of planets into the Federation, and leading more into the Romulan War intrigue and how that played out. I mean, that that was natural, um, you know, those were natural angles to go with, and then just how some of the races were getting along, and and then you had room for you know character dramas in between that. So, um, oh, and he has said uh, that he would have had, um, you know, a lot the way that Gene Roddenberry wanted to have um, Bill Campbell come back and play Captain Koloth on a recurring basis as the Kirk's recurring Klingon nemesis. Uh, they wanted to have uh, Jeff Combs come back and play Shran on a recurring basis, as yeah. a re- no, not as a nemesis so much, but as a recurring character. Uh, maybe even join the regular cast as, as you know on his own ship, but. Bopping in that much, so that would have that you know that would have been uh, that would have been great. It would have been uh, so much mileage, wouldn't there, to continue it? Now, of course, on to another of your own endeavors at the moment, and that would be the Geek Nation tour oh. <laughs> taking place across the USA. Now, for fans who maybe are interested in getting involved in this, tell me a bit about uh, the tour and what kind of sites you're taking in. It sounds fascinating. Well, it was a. Uh, the filming locations of Star Trek is a project that I've been working on, and you can get a little information online, but I've uh, been working on a different angle. And um, um, uh, last year at Vegas, a, a gentleman came up to me, and he has a company called Geek Nation Tours, Terrace uh, Cassidy. And he's been doing this for three or four years. He has a travel agency in Alberta, Canada. Uh, and he's been doing special, not just Star Trek, but he's done some ga- tours for gamers to gaming conventions, military historians, um, military recreators. He's gone to American Civil War battle sites. He's done a castle tour in Scotland and um, the UK, maybe Ireland too. I know he's done one in Germany. And he's had a lot of success with this, and he keeps them small and intimate, and uh, people have a great time. And he came up to me last year and said he'd been thinking about doing uh, a Star Trek tour. And I, I was like, well, that's serendipity because I'm, I'm thinking about something in that same vein myself. And uh, we've basically put together a tour that piggybacks onto the Vegas convention. Only instead of flying into Vegas, on uh, you know, for Thursday or for, or Wednesday night, because the the, sh- the con- Vegas convention at its most runs Thursday through Sunday. So what we've come up with is a starter starter idea, and we may do something different. We've got another idea for a bigger one that stands alone later, but for right now. You fly into L.A. the Saturday before the Thursday convention, and from Saturday afternoon until Wednesday night when you arrive in Vegas, we're going to film sites first in L.A. and then out, out of town on the road up to Vegas, uh, kind of an extended route around. So Saturday night and then Saturday afternoon night and then Sunday, Monday, and then Tuesday we hit the road, at Tuesday and Wednesday, and go up. So. The thing is, um, it's, it's in August. We announced it in February. We've got seats selling. We're only doing one bus. I, this is one of the things I like about uh, Terrace, the way he does his company. He's not doing two or three buses if he can and having the other two buses just listen on a PA, you know, a disembodied voice talking to them <laughs> um, because we're doing it to one bus. So we, we, uh, it starts with 14 people, but we have a max cutoff of 35. So, uh, you know, we're going to go everything, and we're going to go to some common sites, people that if you, if you halfway read, you know about Vasquez Rocks and the Gorn fight from Arena. Uh, you know about some of the other, you know, places. Uh, and what's funny is thanks to Voyager's episode, Futures, you know, Futures In, we, things like the Griffith Observatory now is, aside from a cool site and a cool, you know, sci-fi geek site, <laughs> science geek site, it's part of Voyager, you know, from that two-part episode. And where Rain Robinson's lab was, and they have a phaser fight out in front. And the Santa Monica Pier is part of that episode. But, you know, we're going to go to Bronson Canyon, which was like 18 different planets, <laughs> <laughs> as well as the Bat Cave in the 60s on Batman. 
and we'll we will do a Hollywood downtown Hollywood tour and go to the uh, Grauman's Chinese Theater for the 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 forecourt with the hand. My wife calls it the hand and foot museum <laughs> in the concrete where all the Trek actors are, and the Walk of Fame. Uh, you know the pier, several places. So we've got some common but uncommon, and the idea being that yes, you could come on your own to some of the better known ones. But a, you won't be in a group of fellow fans. You might be by yourself, or you know, and it won't be on you. You're you're being pampered, and uh, we're going to throw in some extra things as well. For instance, at Vasquez Rocks, you can go on your own. You can go to a convention and see Bobby Clark, who wore the suit, the Gorn suit, was one of the stunt men that did that, yeah. and he's a great guy. And I have a video of him that I put up uh, a few months ago. If you want to go see that at, at Trekland, but how many times do you get to see? Bobby Clark at Vasquez talking to you about those two days. That's legendary. That's going to be a special moment. And, you know, a big chunk of the tour is taking – we were laughing about if people would maybe bring their, their uniforms or their costumes. And, you know, if you're going to be at Starfleet Academy, either the TV version or JJ's version, why not? Why not at least wear your top and do it and, or bring your original series – bring your gold shirt and have a, have a shot with, uh, with Bobby at Vasquez. So it's whatever people get. And the other thing is we, uh, Terrace has this set up to where if you come with your spouse and your spouse isn't a fan, he'll take care of it. They won't be bored. Um, if you already have your hotel in Vegas and don't need it to be included in the package, uh, you know, he can handle that. Um, it, I just encourage anybody to go to geeknationtours.com, and, and he's got several tours going on, and just go to the, the Exploring Trek Sites Hollywood to Vegas with Larry Nimichek. And um, in his little icon there, he has a happy face, Geek Nation Tours with glasses on, but he's, he's vulcanized it <laughs> for this tour. Great, great. So it kind, of, it kind of stands out. Maybe we can get you one for the show. And it has the whole tour schedule and uh, all the options you can do. And, he, of course, you take a deposit and um, you know, pay it off as it goes along. So I'm really excited. I'm really looking forward to this. And, and it's the kind of thing that you know, when I've had a visitor, I mean, I sat down basically and planned it with him. It's one thing to have one person and you in your car, but thinking about the logistics of 14 or 20 or 30 or 35 people, you know, adds a little bit of dimension to it. But we, we get around and we've got an awful lot crammed in. And then we go out of town, we're up north. We go from L urban LA up to the mountains and the desert. We're going to go to the Q Continuum. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, hopefully see Kirk's cabin. And, uh, you know, Hanon 4, or Voyager's Basics. The other thing was we tried to get things from all the series, you know, things that were accessible, things that made sense, iconic moments and some obscure ones, and things from all the shows. So, mm, mm, mm. but we're not doing everything. There's over, you know, there's, there's 100, over 100, 150 sites that you could go to. Some of them are obscure and a little on the boring side, but, you know, if you're a completist, you'd want to go to that gravel quarry eventually. But it's not much to look at, you know. And um, and we've got some things for down the road if this if this uh, makes or when this makes I should be sincere. So and he's mar he's in Canada. He markets it to Australia, Japan, the UK, which is you know Ireland, Germany, and um, which is why I appreciate you having me on and let me talk about it in that in that way too. So it's an absolutely wonderful idea, and I encourage people definitely to to check that out and. You know, if you're going to the Vegas convention, what better way to, to spend your time before that? As you said, you, you've just sold it to me there. Bobby Clark at the site where he filmed those scenes. I mean, look, any Trek fan is going to say yes to that straight away. Uh, I don't want to take too much of your time, Larry. I've already taken quite a bit already, and I'm certainly uh, grateful to have you on here. Um, if, if I could, I just would let everybody, because I know you're, you're global... But I'm going to be, aside from at the Vegas convention and uh, Comic-Con in San Diego, I've got um, my hometown convention, SoonerCon has me. That's, that's in June, June 15th. And there's two conventions in Lake Charles, which is kind of a resort town in southwest Louisiana. And one is called SyphaCon. It's coming up in two weeks in April. And another one called BayouCon, which is uh, June 30th, July 1st. And then our, our tour in Vegas and... Um, there's going to be a convention and a festival for Walter Caney getting his star Excellent. in September uh, on the Walk of Fame, and I'll be involved with that. And El Paso Con in Texas in September, which is a Comic Con, and Starbase Indy, which is Thanksgiving weekend for the U.S. in uh, Indianapolis. So um, it's kind of stepped up. And on top of that, maybe later in the year, if, if, whether I'm on or I slip you the news, hopefully there'll be some other news coming, uh, another project that I've got going later on. 
fantastic fantastic and i think uh, it's uh, something that is going to be looked forward to that tour is also hitting europe now just to give you one opportunity here i know th there's a bit of a call out now for fans in ireland i believe you, you're looking to contact people over in this side of the world well right well two things um and not a big deal but i just love to see we're as i said we're taking a, a totally non business tour of ireland in may and uh, if anybody is in Dublin especially, uh, we have an extra day or two and I'd love to meet up with some fans. I could do a show, a mini show out of my laptop <laughs> if we could get a projector or something or just to talk and, you know, have a few. And uh, I know it's you all don't get to have many com – uh, I saw there's one or two conventions, but uh, if, if there's actually some diehard Trek fans in Ireland or can get to Dublin, uh, just, you know, email me or, or – uh, Facebook me on Larry Nimichek's Trekland is my Facebook site, for one thing. And Twitter is at Larry Nimichek, uh, N-E-M-E-C-E-K, every other letter is an E, as my mom taught it to me. Or uh, my, con my website has the contact email, Larry at Larry Nimichek.com. And um, let me know. Let me know. I've, had a f I've heard from a few people in Dublin. Um, I know you all are – I know uh, – not you all, but over in London, they're going to have a huge – convention now they were finally able to announce it i don't know if i'm going to be able to come over for that but always interested in coming um yeah, yeah. like i said i haven't been over in, in way too long and um god we saw enough of those germans i'd like to <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, i'd like to no i take that back i have a ton of friends in germany uh, and they've been they've been really good um but yeah i would love to come over sometime like and do that uh Again, if anyone was a survivor of the Con of Wrath, I'd like to hear from them. We have our fan donation site up at conorath.com from $10 up to, you know, a couple of thousand and a little package and a thank you. Everybody gets a, everybody gets a screen credit. So um, I think that's, that's kind of run the gamut. Excellent. Aside well, look, from the fact that I can't believe I'm going to be on a video podcast. This is, <laughs> this is exciting. Keep, keep me informed about what you're up to in Ireland for sure because if, if you need anybody to film that or do any video for it I would love to be involved and it oh, certainly would okay. be a momentous day uh, I, I think to have a, an Irish convention meet up of any kind I was telling you that they are very few and far between I know Irish fans who maybe check out this will echo those thoughts for sure so anything that uh, goes ahead I'm sure is going to be a great day and I would well, certainly uh, hope that people get in touch if not least to know that there are still Trek fans here. I know they're out there somewhere, uh, but they're, they're quite tricky to find. But listen, Larry, again, thank you so much for coming on. I look forward to hearing about what you're up to in the future and going forward then, hopefully those tours will work out. And again, the documentary, best of luck with that. Oh, Darren, thank you so much for having me on. It's been great to talk and I can't wait to see how this, how I look on a monitor. <laughs> <laughs>